This is Border Sessions. Fast Moving Targets and the Innovation Station are doing interviews here the coming two days. We are in The Hague and the first, uh, my first guest is uh, Tijmen Schep. Uh, Tijmen, uh, who are you and what do you do? My name is Tijmen Schep. I'm uh, the creative director of the Setup Media Lab in the Netherlands uh, in Utrecht. And I work at Knowledge Land, which is a foundation in Amsterdam that um, helps society or innovate basically. Yeah. You were one of the first speakers uh, today, so what yeah. was the, the, the story you told uh, your audience? Well, in a way I told two stories um, with a break in the middle. The first part was about big data and how big data is making us um, less human basically. Uh, I think big data is increasingly being used to uh, limit us in ways that we don't really understand very well. In the sense that uh, in the reputation economy, more and more pressure is put on us to behave in certain ways, to be become well behaved. Um, for instance, you see this in China, where now every citizen will get a score, a reputation score. So, so the, the, they call it the, the social credit score. And that's being used not only to, uh, to find out if you're, if you're well behaved, if you're a good citizen, but also to restrict access to good government jobs. Uh, to, if you want to get a loan, a good score might be important. Um, if you want to, uh, well, I said all these kind of things will be connected to this system. So this system is not just this data system of reputation, but it's increasingly being used to influence your life in interesting ways. And that's how we get to the second part of my talk. And there I talk about the Internet, Internet of Things and how that's going to be connected to these reputation systems and how they could be connected. So we explore the dark side of that. Uh, so we try to explore a world in which um, these Internet of Things are not just these happy Internet of Things that will make us better and and more human or happier as you always see. But there's a dark side that we don't really explore all that often and that we should explore just to be able to avoid it. For Can you give an example? What is the possible uh, dark side? Because I've always uh, learned that it's going to help me because it, uh, uh, systems know when the garbage uh, needs to be uh, emptied right. And, uh, right. and, and, and it helps me to find a parking sp uh, place. Yeah. So, uh, so what is the dark side? Well, an interesting story that, that started us off is um, by Cory Doctorow. He wrote, wrote a book called Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. And in it he explains uh, a world where reputation is everything. And this man, he wants to take the elevator, but his reputation is too low to take the elevator. So he has to take the stairs. Right? So society kind of segregates him into the people who have to take the stairs because they're not cool enough. Uh, and you know, the elders do take the elevator. And this is kind of happening in, in loads of directions. Like we explore the idea that you can imagine a toaster that slightly burns your toast if your reputation score is too low. That could be a thing. Or um, another idea we explored was um, a bed. Imagine a, a smart bed. And that smart bed knows your itinerary, it knows your agenda. So it, it knows that tonight you're supposed to be sleeping alone. But you're not sleeping alone. You're sleeping together with someone. It's, think, it's thinking, hey, what's, what's going on here? Is this man cheating on his girlfriend? And the bed could then decide to inform your girlfriend that, it, you're, that she's being cheated on. Or not, it could side with you and say, well, you know, you know come on. Yeah. Amongst men, you know, this should be okay. Um, the thing is, the bed has to make an ethical decision. And uh, we explore this idea that, that these devices will have to make very difficult ethical decisions. And how will they make them? And which, which decisions will they make? So uh, I could imagine a world in which uh, a cheap bed that you get maybe at a, you know, a cheap store will side with you and say, you know, come on, you, you know, the cheating is human. It's, only, it's okay, you know, I won't tell anyone. While um, an Alping bed, you know, which is you know, a rich bed, a quality bed, will uphold good values and, and not uh, tell your uh, will tell your girlfriend what's going on and keep you and your girlfriend in a healthy relationship. Yeah, and um, so, uh, uh, well, in a, in a world with, with, with good people, uh, aren't we all? Uh, well, aren't yeah. we? Are yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but 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 of course, I, I like of course the, the the examples you you give and they they. Uh, but the 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 weakness of the examples is that I then think, well, that's not going to happen. Sure. And yeah. but this is a this is a design thing. So this is this is just an exploration. Uh, this probably won't happen. But it looking at this helps us think about this darker side, which we rarely talk about. If you go to Silicon Valley, you only hear the happy stories, the, the sales pitch of how this is going to make your city more efficient or how it's going to make your life better. But you never hear about the possible downsides or they are not really explored in the same degree. And I think it should be 50-50. We should explore the possibilities. We should also really put some effort into thinking about, hey, hey how could this negatively influence the world, especially a world in which people are not perfect and people will abuse it. Like imagine if with email, we, when we developed it, we already thought about spam. Like if we try to think, hey, how might people abuse this? Then we might have built some better uh, functionality to, to be able to fix that or to deal with that. But we didn't. 
But I think with the Internet of Things, we should. We should try to uh, anticipate some of these, these things. And I think you can because technologists often say that you can extrapolate you know, the amount of chips in something, then it'll become smarter and all that. But I think you can also extrapolate human decency or human intentions, human emotions, human nature. You can extrapolate that as well and, and figure out what will happen or what people will probably use it for. Yeah, you've written a book, a Design My Privacy. Yeah. Um, um, so, so it says eight principles. Yeah. Um, so how do you design for privacy? Yes, that's a good question. So this, this is a book that's written for people who are asked to design smart things, but who don't really have a lot of experience with that yet. So I'm thinking, like, technologists will often have a little bit of a background on the privacy discussion and the ethics debate, because they've been having that for years on websites like Slashdot, but uh, architects don't, fashion designers don't, cooks don't, like all kinds of designers don't have this background, and this book is kind of a way to help them uh, when they start uh, creating smart things, where should they start? And it, the first four principles are very, you know, technology focused, very understandable, like don't uh, get too much data and if you do get data encrypted, uh, think about privacy beforehand, think like a hacker once in a while, like I just said. But the, the, the last four principles are more from the area of sociology and philosophy, you could say, and they're more about why it's important to allow anonymous use, for example, with your, your devices, or um, why we should avoid creating too many black boxes. I think we have a habit of doing that because we think that the devices that are usable are always invisible, like they have to float away into the background, disappear into the background. I think that's a very bad idea. I think we have to create a world in which our devices um, are not invisible, they're very readable and we can look into them and, and understand how these algorithms are working and, and why they make certain decisions. I think that's something we don't have a design language for yet. We don't, we don't have a way of easily telling normal people like, this is what your smart <laughs> is doing, and this is why. This is why it's doing that, and you can understand that you maybe change it. Yeah, um, a, a problem uh, I see and feel uh, at the moment is, because I talk to a lot of people who are uh, concerned uh, about privacy matters, uh, and at the same time, we all use uh, the big platforms and, and give them all the uh, information, all the data uh, we yeah. share with everyone. Uh, so a big problem is that uh, people don't feel uh, uh, the problem. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and how are we going to solve that? How, yeah. how, how we that's a difficult question. I think given enough time, we will feel the problems, I think. Yeah. That's, that's one thing. And that's the other thing is that the, that's what we at Setup do. Like we create projects that try to make tangible this future now. So when we created a database of all Dutch people, that's what we, our previous project, we actually did that. We scraped online information together, created a real database of Dutch people, and now we're using that to do some you know, interesting explorations of what could you do with that to be really, you know, how, how naughty could you be with that? And now we're really building these devices. So we're working with a couple of designers and thinkers like Marcel Schouwenaar, uh, Dennis de Bell, uh, and they are actually going to build some devices that will use a fictitious uh, reputation score to influence their behavior or their, around you. And so we might actually get an elevator that does this. We might actually get a bed that does this. They're, they're building these things yeah. just to get the discussion started, the conversation started around these possible downsides or these, these negative uses that we don't really anticipate yeah. all too well. Yeah, because you've been, for the pro projects you just mentioned, you, 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 like you said, you've been scraping all the public uh, uh, available uh, information yeah. on people. What, what, in, in what way did it surprise you? Uh, what sort of an information? <laughs> in a lot of ways. Under? Yeah, when we, when we decided to create a database of all Dutch people, we thought we'd just get information from Hives and Schoolbank, which is like classmates.com and all kinds of online websites, and we scraped it together. And in six weekends, with a lot of experts' help, we got this database which now has 800,000, like, information, good information on 800,000 Dutch people in it. And, you know, eight, about 8 million uh, vague information, but 800,000 good information. Um, in six weekends, so that's that's kind of crazy. So that's that's it surprises that it was possible and it was this easy. It was that surprised us incredibly, and it also surprised us often what we found. Like we found very strange data sets online that should not be online. Mm -hmm. um, to give an example, uh, some city councils share Excel sheets with the names and date of birth of, of newborn children online. Congratulations, welcome into the community. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that information can also be abused. But like like with email, you know, we don't really see that yet. So. I think this is like a wake-up call for people to maybe think about what they share online, the data they share, um, and think about abuse. Yeah. Will, it, will it be? Uh, is, is it going to be a unique selling point for for new devices, new tools, etc.? To say, uh, well, your privacy is uh, 
the proof of privacy. I, I definitely think so. Yes, I think we'll get we'll get some marks or some things like that. But also already you see Apple doing it. Like Apple is is aware that privacy will become something that's a luxury, and uh, they will want to connect it to their brand. So yes, I think that's going to be very important. And I think you already see some like the, the amount of leaks is growing exponentially. And I think the amount of people that are affected by leaks will grow in the next few years. People will start to go, hey, mm -hmm. you know, that was really annoying. Uh, can I buy a device that doesn't leak or leaks less? Of course, everything will always leak, but that's something also that is not being told to people, but they yeah. will have to learn about. And you say uh, Apple uh, is, is busy with that, but at the same time, uh, Apple uh, can know more about me than anyone else. Because yes. everything I do in my life yes. uh, goes through my, uh, sure. my iPhone. In the end, it's about trust still. Yeah. Uh, it's about who you trust. Like, um, uh, Helen Nissenbaum is a privacy professor and she explains this really well. She says, privacy is not about controlling your data and keeping it to yourself. It's about um, in certain situations, certain contexts, you have certain expectations of privacy. Like when you go to a doctor, you might tell him a lot more than you tell your baker. But that's okay. That's how you know, yeah. we, we trust him. And, and in our society, with all these contexts where with certain expectations, and the same thing will, will, will happen uh, yeah, with Apple. Apple, you have certain expectations right now of how they deal with your data. They might break that trust in the future, and then we might not trust them. But so far, they're doing, you know, we, don't, we haven't really seen yeah. the, the, the problems to a big degree yet. Yeah. But, uh, so so if, if we talk about the big, uh, uh, the big uh, internet uh, names, uh, which one, uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to say don't you trust, but do you trust less than the other ones? Um, well, I'm sure that all of them will want to protect our data to a degree because otherwise, you know, your clients will well, leave well, you. Yeah, uh, or gonna, yeah you that's know. what I al always say. Uh, but, yeah. but at the same time, that is going to be difficult, isn't it? For example, there have been uh, initiatives to do a sort of an open source Facebook. Yeah. yeah. But my friends didn't go there. I, no, was, exactly. I was on, I was on yeah. my own. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. the same thing is, we could uh, all use a sort of a different browser, uh, but at the, yeah. Google is doing quite yeah. a good yeah. uh, a good. Sure, good but there are also moments like, for instance, when, when um, WhatsApp was bought, a lot of people tried Telegram, right? Like there, there, is some, some yeah. there are some moments when there's an opportunity to get a whole group of people to switch. Yeah. And of course, if at that time we actually had something like Signal, like a good, app that, that respects privacy to a large degree, then that would have been an interesting uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that, that we'll get more chance like this. And I think, yeah, as, as people become more privacy aware, as they undoubtedly will, then we'll see more demand and then this will happen. Yeah. Can you give me an example um, uh, on, on, uh, about yourself? So, so what do you do when you are behind your laptop or your mobile? What do you do different uh, right. than, than I do? Right. Well, I think a, a step back would be that as an individual, I can do some things, but it will never be the whole solution. Like we have to, designers have to start thinking about this. Policymakers have to start thinking about this. This, I think big data and the downsides of big data is a problem on the scale of global warming, for example. It's something that you can't fix on your own. Of course, you have to do things. We all have to do things to try it. So yes, I have apps that protect my privacy I'm on my smartphone. I have a version of Android that, that is, protects my privacy to a degree. I have certain apps that do that. I have plugins in my browser. Uh, I even have like um, a loyalty card of my, uh, my um, supermarket. I have two of them stuck, stuck together so that the cashier chooses which one of my identities she, she puts my shopping on. I, I think about these things and yeah. it's a game to me. Yeah. But I also see that's a way bigger picture. And of course, this, the book that I wrote is, is um, for that reason is to reach the designers. The things I do with setup are to reach a wider audience. And the things I do with my other job, Kennisland, Northland, is to, to reach policymakers. So I think we have to reach all these fields and we all have to work together to solve this problem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Fast Moving Targets and the Innovation Station are doing uh, interviews here for two days. We are at the border sessions in uh, The Hague. Really interesting uh, event. Um, uh, the difference for uh, when you compare, for example, to, to the next web in Amsterdam, it's very technology uh, and, and startup focused, and this is more society focused. That would be my uh, description of, uh, of this event. Innovation in society more than uh, start a new business and become uh, the new uh, billion dollar. Uh, company. Uh, we will uh, be back with you when you are uh, watching live and otherwise you can watch all the interviews on demand uh, through um, our, our YouTube station or the site. Thank you.